welcome to what we think is a pretty unique exercise. What we are really trying to do here is to draw up a list of some kind of the 100 books that could change your life. One of the reasons we are doing this is because uh, it's wonderful to see readership going up in India, readership of books, readership of newspapers and so on and so forth. Yet at the same time when you look at our bestseller lists, when you look at what people are really reading, when you look at our railway stations and bookshops and so on and so forth, the kind of books loaded up there and the kind of books that people seem to taunt and flaunt and, and read are quite opposite to what we on this table might discuss at the end of the day. Because uh, it really doesn't give you great pleasure when you see a well-known German author's book uh, at every railway station. And we are sure actually that the wisdom of the five of you will bring to the table here. And uh, we really hope we'll have a nice invigorating debate where we you know, trash out the big books. And more importantly, bring the kind of liveliness that books ought to bring to our lives. Mukul, you were just saying, you know, the, some of the common books that are already there in, you know, in all our lists, I think they come to about 15 or so. Shall we straight away put them in the, in the final list? So these are the overlaps in the list. That, and the rule is uh, two or more books. So that's the Mahabharat, War and Peace, Midnight Children, A Suitable Boy in Patagonia, 100 Years of Solitude, To Kill a Mockingbird, The God of Small Things, Beloved, The Left Hand of Darkness, The Alexandria Quartet, Train to Pakistan, The Story of My Experiments with Truth, and Smith in the City, which stands in basically for Woodhouse. We can talk about this subsequently and um, the shadow lines. That is a question that there can books change lives. The whole idea of, of, of in this thing, of, you know, do, do they really change lives? And you had some doubts, right? I mean no, um, my view simply was that, uh, is that the distinction between the, you know, the hundreds, hundred books you feel uh, m most warmly towards, so more, most enthusiastic about, and the hundred books that you think in some way are transformative, is a difficult distinction mm. because it's in the nature, especially of fiction, that uh, you know, um, in the time that you read it, it does in fact uh, transfix you. And uh, some novels induce a kind of sense of recognition and sense of wonder, which is truly, uh, you know, life-changing. But I'm not sure you could actually get to a hundred of them. I mean, for example, I'm thinking of of reading. Uh, Money was just mentioning this, the fire next time. Uh, which is this great short polemic. So On the standard. other hand, he keeps saying Negro. I know. But and today we can't use the yeah, word. That's but uh, that's so I'm just concerned that, uh, I'm sure it won't happen. I'm just concerned that we shouldn't actually be stretching a point for a book that we know is less good than something that the same person has written. Um, and I'm not saying this in the context of discovery of India and autobiography because there can be reasonable differences of opinion about which is the better book. But I don't think we should, in a sense, um, it would be odd to choose a book by someone that you think is more significant, uh, but not necessarily the best thing that that person. But I had a slightly different take on this, mm. which was, I was looking at books that were both personally transformative, as in when I read them, there was some kind of shock or some kind of shift in worldview. But I was also looking at one of the reasons why my list is so heavy on science writing and science fiction, which I hadn't expected when I sat down to do it, or why it has some of the oldest myths in the world, is because I was looking at books that redefine what it means for you to be human at this point of time. So a lot of them are things that you would not expect to be moved by. When I read the epic of Gilgamesh just a few years ago, I thought I was going to read it as a dry text. I did not expect to be so moved by the idea of somebody sitting down to write the first written story in human history and find that that story still appealed. I am a child of partition and therefore I have been very concerned with matters of war and peace for almost all my life. And I've always wondered why they went so wrong in the past and therefore to try and have an understanding of the philosophy of history to be able to put facts into some kind of a larger perspective. I am also a child of independence, I am a midnight's child if you like, and therefore the freedom movement and what it meant 
is something that has uh, obsessed me, if you like, for quite a long time. And uh, moral <coughs> questions of what is right and what is wrong, which I find uh, most influential in my life, is the writings of T.S. Eliot. And uh, one line in particular from the murder in the cathedral, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. And I think all of us are frequently faced in life with the need to do not only the right thing for the wrong reasons, but sometimes the wrong thing for the right reasons. And so I would begin by saying that uh, the first set of books which I would commend are number one, The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914 by Christopher Clarke. Secondly, the story of the opening month of the war, the First World War, which is, I think, the only thing that's really of interest about the First World War until we get to the Treaty of Versailles, which signals the beginning of the Second World War. But in that, I would recommend The Guns of August by Barbara Tuchman. Uh, my, my, my third book from not that period, because we've covered two of them, is the in-between time. What happened in the 20s and worst of all in the 30s that led to the biggest disaster that humanity has ever known, which was Hitler on the one hand, Tojo on the other. And what happened is in a book by Piers Brendan, a Cambridge historian, called The Dark Valley, a panorama of the 1930s, where he takes the history of the entire world and brings it into, into, into perspective. From there, I think one moves smoothly into A.J.P. Taylor's utterly outstanding work, The Origins of the Second World War. I agree. Yeah. The work of history. And once you've read all this, you start asking yourself, why is there so much argument? And when you come across so much argument, I think the book by, uh, or rather it was a set of lectures, by E.H. Carr called What is History? is uh, indispensable reading for understanding how, why, how and why it is that history turns out as it does and then gets interpreted as it does. David? Well, you know, I, I, when I started doing this, I, I must admit that I had a bias. You know, I um, increasingly I find myself resentful of um, a canon that we've willingly accepted because that was what we started with, which is the Western camp. So I looked at a whole bunch. I mean, this exercise has been done by several uh, <coughs> publications and uh, colleges and think tanks and so on. All of them sort of have a very similar list with a nod to the East in terms of one or two books. So my first list was hugely weighted towards India. You know, so in that sense, it's slightly, it doesn't completely reflect my uh, my list of the, the books that kind of changed my life. You know, for example, uh, so I made a second list, um, which had on it a book like, say, The Leopard, which I think is one of the greatest novels I've ever read. Um, when I started reading my first, writing my first novel, it, uh, I subconsciously sort of I was looking at how you treat family in the context of history, and I noticed that Mukul has it on it. So, you know, uh, on his list. So, my five, uh, I would definitely say The Leopard. I would say um, uh, the remains of the day. I think for uh, my money, a, a quiet novel, which is more powerful than pretty much every other novel that I've read in a long, long time, um, would be that book, which, which, which again deals with history, which deals with politics, but deals with it in such a subtle way that I have not read its like. Um, they should go to novel. Yeah. Uh, the Great Gatsby, another favorite of mine. Uh, and uh, for my money, the greatest study of violence uh, in contemporary literature is probably Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. It's uh, among my top three contemporary novels. And the last one, uh, I'm spoiled for choice. I, I think I would have to pick Borges, um, the stories I imagine. When, it, when we talk about a book that changes you or transforms you and stays with you for a long time, 
even though you may have read it at a particular moment in your life, uh, is that when I think of my favorite books, I think of books I keep returning to. Uh, I don't look for a replication of reality anymore, I find, in my all-time favorites, whether fiction or non-fiction. What I really want uh, in non-fiction or fiction is an intensification of reality. Uh, Money, for example, said uh, he relates books, uh, his, his favorite books, to history, particularly to personal history, because he says he's a child of partition and of independence. Uh, but he actually didn't mention uh, any work of fiction. And I was immediately thinking, and it's uh, top of my list actually, uh, what greater exponent of, of fiction and in, in partition stories than the great Urdu writer Sadat Hassan Manto. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you know, people read him in bits, his short stories or his journalism or his memoirs. Uh, but one of the most brilliant all-time translations is called uh, Bitter Fruit, the very best of Sadat Hassan Manto, and what an extraordinary Who range of Khalid Hassan, oh, of course, the yeah. keeper of his flame for many, many years, the journalist and translator. And I think that's extraordinary. Similarly, uh, from uh, that same yawn uh, is, uh, but in English, again by an Urdu scholar, is Twilight in Delhi by Emma Dali. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's extraordinary what it tells you about the inner life of a city and yet the drumbeat of war is distantly heard but always in the background so fiction uh, placed in history can in my opinion be as transformative and life changing uh, but for example uh, for biography uh, I would really say the one I enjoy and again and again uh, out of Ram Chandra Guha, the historian's canon, is certainly his first book, uh, Very Elven, His Tribals in India. Because it's a difficult book to define. Is it conventional biography? Is it a slice of history? This multifaceted character starts out as a Christian missionary, a Gandhian, rejects it all to become probably modern India's greatest living anthropologist. It's an extraordinary exploration. Uh, that's definitely something uh, uh, I go back to again and again. It's just come out in a new edition. Similarly, when I you... Had, I had one biography on my list, but for the opposite reason to yours. It, sh it shook me up with sheer horror. It's Stalin by Edvard Radzinski. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you discover what are the depths of human depravity reading that book. Please. Anyway, uh, just one last point. Uh, I mean, I've also put in... Uh, a remarkable Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biography of the ancient world. Uh, characters from the ancient world are very, very difficult to write about. I mean, people have Robin Lane Fox's Alexander the Great, but no great biography of the Emperor Ashoka because the argument among scholars is that primary evidence is absolutely difficult to find. But a Pulitzer Prize winning example is Cleopatra. A Life by Stacey Schiff. I found it riveting, absolutely, <coughs> what she does from a great mythical character of history, well, almost mythical, uh, is to uh, dig up subsequent and later records uh, and therefore explore not just Egyptian but both Roman and Greek history. Uh, last of all, nobody's really talked about subaltern history or even subaltern life life from the margins and this is so important as, uh, as uh, in both fiction and, and non-fiction I'm thinking of Munshi Premchand, Godan uh, which is a great classic or in contemporary terms in English say take something like Behind the Beautiful Forevers by Catherine Booth, the American journalist yeah, yeah. just two or three yeah. years ago it came out yeah. but in the middle of this gung-ho sense of free market, liberal, modern India, what she tells you about this island slum yeah. crowded between Bombay's great skyscrapers and international airports, I found it a startling portrait in terms of documentary reality. My five, um, I don't know whether there's anything uh, that's unifying about them in a kind of prefatory way, but I think broadly speaking they have to do with transitions that we've seen uh, in the past 150 years. I think my, 
on top of my list would be this great, great uh, novel, which I think is the greatest realist novel of the last 50 years of the 20th century, which is Mario Vargas Llosa's The War of the End of the World, which I is a truly extraordinary novel yeah. about a Chileastic insurrection based upon a real-life historical event in the in late 19th century Brazil, which should actually be required reading for any state that's attempting to deal with any kind of millenarian uh, stroke uh, sort of cargo cult type uh, The description of that priest in the first page. Just extraordinary novel. Yeah. I think it's, um, I mean, uh, Vargas Llosa is such a great novelist that you, you know, uh, I, I thought of putting in Aunt Julia and the scriptwriter, which mm. is the other end yeah, of yeah, extraordinary yeah, yeah. comic experimental novel, okay, which okay. is a great, great novel. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the other two have to do with mid 20th century European transitions. One is the Tin Drum by Grass, which I think, without which I think Midnight Children doesn't even begin to be a gleam in Rushdie's eye, uh, because I think it's um, it's constitutive of Rushdie's novel, which is also a wonderful novel, and it's I think uh, the great angsty German novel of uh, of that transition from from fascism to uh, to a republic. The second of this kind, again, to, in a sense, uh, a novel of the Cold War is, and I think it's here as much for its subject as for its formal invention, which is the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. Mm. It has, it's uh, innovative as a novel in a way that's difficult to imagine. It has, you remember there's a bit where uh, he has a section called A Brief Introduction to Litost, and he proceeds yeah. to tell you what Litost actually means. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. comic, cynical, wry, and it's, but it still has these great bass notes. It's yeah. just this. So you'd, pick, you'd pick that over the unbearable light of the beast? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think uh, the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. It has this great opening where there's a group photograph of a party Politburo. And uh, the deputy leader has given the leader his hat because it's cold. And then the deputy leader falls afoul of the Politburo and he's airbrushed out of the picture. So the only thing that remains of him in the picture is his hat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a work of complete genius. Mm. And a cynical comic genius, which is, yeah. I think, very In rare. fact, on, on that lithos, isn't it, I mean, it's a little reminiscent of this huzum that Pamuk describes in Istanbul. Mm. You know, it's like an indescribable melancholy of, yeah. I mean, it's like an unbearable... It's an attempt to provide a word for an emotion that is otherwise unnameable. Yeah, unnameable, mm. yeah. It's, so, uh, the fourth... Um, for me would be um, it's a tough one um, I think Portrait of the Artist is a Young Man because if you know we have several books in these lists that are in a broad way coming of age novels and I think many of our most intense experiences as readers is to read a coming of age novel I think Sunil has Catcher in the Rye I have this wonderful novel by uh, David Mitchell called uh, Black Swan Green uh, there are, you know, uh, and I think in an odd way, uh, it's a not coming of age novel, but Peter Pan is one of the great fictional inventions uh, of the last 150 years because it induces in you a kind of wondering melancholy, which I've never felt while reading any other novel. But All it induced in me is an urge to escape, <laughs> which I think is a key qualification to enjoyment in reading. That's why we all adore Wood. Isn't it oppressive? I mean, it's also oppressive. It uh, is. It's a deeply oppressive novel, but it's also just wonderful. Okay, the last two are... Um, did I say Tindra uh, a, a book of A book of essays. The only book of essays that I could think of that actually uh, ranks with great fiction is, to my mind, not Borges' stories, but his essays, which are, uh, there's a volume called Other Inquisitions, which okay. contains some of the most, uh, you know, um, extraordinary imagi imaginative leaps you you ever encounter in, uh, you know, in, in non-fiction. Uh, so he has this great essay where he says, it has this arresting first sentence where he says, great writers, don't just invent their descendants, they reinvent their ancestors as well. So what he's actually saying is that when you have a writer like Kafka, he, 
he defines a quality called Kafkaesque, which is naturally imitated by people who come after him. But it also begins, he also makes it possible for you to understand someone like Edgar Allan Poe in a way that you wouldn't have because you suddenly realize that Poe has qualities that are Kafkaesque, you know. And he's full of these extraordinary insights. It's just a completely riveting book of, uh, book of essays. And it's not fictional. Um, I think he has in it something called A Brief History of Time. And anyway, it's, it's, it's a great book. And finally, I just say uh, uh, either Raag Darbari or uh, uh, Adha Gaon. Uh, because Adha Gaon is a great, great partition novel. And Raag Darbari is an extraordinary satire of Republican politics. Such a difficult choice. You know? And I would actually, um, I mean, I'd like both, but I, you know, uh, I'd just like to say that these are two really great landmark novels uh, in Hindi. I'd endorse Raag Darbari. I'd probably go for Raag Darbari because Darbari. of its capaciousness. Yeah. Your five. Uh, first was the epic of Gilgamesh, which I was mm. reading about. I think I want it on the list very much because it's the kind of book that everybody knows about but doesn't actually go to and read. And I was reading it at a time when a close friend of Devang Shu's was, uh, had just received notice that he was going to die of cancer and there was nothing we could do about it. And it was <coughs> in the middle of that that I came across this remarkable speech of anguish between Enkidu and Gil Gilgamesh. And Enkidu, who is Gilgamesh's closest friend, is facing his own death. <coughs> and that death is inevitable. You know, he's been wounded and he has to go. And Gilgamesh is facing the fact that he is happy that it's not him who has to die. All right. You know? Mm. But at the same time, he has a sorrow for his friend. Mm. And for some reason, it just hadn't struck me that I would reach into one of the oldest epics, the oldest written story in the world, and find such an incredibly human moment in it. Was it a new translation? So I don't think it was a new translation. It was, I've forgotten who it was, unfortunately, mm. but it, I sent that name to Satish. But it was an old and very classic translation. Mm. I found that many of the things that I write about these days are contained in that book, you know, whether it's the embracing of life in a way that you push away death, the division between men and the animals. And I think I'm shocked to find that so many of our themes, friendship, betrayal, war, love, they're contained in that. I didn't expect it to be such a good read either, which is why mm. I'm <laughs> putting it down there. Uh, the second one would be Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl. I was thinking of two books actually when Mani Shankar was going over his list of war that were allied. One was Anne Frank's Diary mm. and one was Man's Search for Meaning, Victor, uh, Victor Frankl's I account of... It's an extraordinary book. He wrote parts of it when he was in the camps in Auschwitz. Um, and he was watching his family die. He knew that he was on the list of those. He survived as it happened, but he didn't know from day to day whether he was going to or not. And the question that he asked at that time was not, how do we endure suffering? It was simply, how, are we, how do we make ourselves happy in these circumstances? This is what you've been dealt. And he was looking at his federal prisoners and at himself and saying, well, actually, you know, what makes us happy is what we choose to focus on every day. And it's how we treat each other with dignity and respect. Um, it's a passionately argued book. I think he wrote it sometime after he'd come back from the camps um, in the middle of the morning for people whom he had irrevocably lost. And it is such a powerful statement of belief in the human condition. So uh, Manishankaraya mentioned self-help books. And when I went towards the self-help category, I said, let's pick one that is at the top of that heap you know, both in creative terms and in emotive terms. I'm not sure what to do with Anne Frank because she's not on anybody else's list, but I know that um, that is a book that I feel that we shouldn't leave out for. I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well. In terms of a coming of age uh, book, I know that it's changed the lives of so many young children I know of. Absolutely. So that's three. Uh, the Left Hand of Darkness is already on the list? It's already on yeah. yeah. Then I'm going to make a pitch for the Sandman series by Neil Gaiman. It was between this and Harry Potter. <laughs> and no, I you chosen well then. Yeah, and I felt that Sandman was both um, magnificent storytelling because ultimately it really doesn't matter. I understand the resistance to the form of the graphic novel. But to me what matters is what worlds are you creating? How well knit are they? And Neil Gaiman's universe is vast beyond... How many volumes is this in? Sandman is about uh, eight or nine. 
nine. Nine. Nine volumes yeah. of storytelling that have, uh, I think this has just shaped the imaginations of every single young storyteller who came after him. And I was thinking of Ursula K. Le Guin's speech at the National Book Awards today where she made a little reference to how the writers of imagination, it is their time now, as opposed to the writers of realism. And uh, nobody better than you. Nobody better than him. And nobody more powerful and poignant. He takes some of the oldest stories again. He's a very good translator of the epics into modern stories that could happen. That is in full I, hmm? I, I would, you know, I've read Gaiman in, uh, in his prose fiction. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, his prose fiction is so American. No, I, I'm not a great fan of his novel. I have yeah. to say that um, I, uh, there was a wonderful short story I read by him which takes off from kind of Sherlock Holmes theme and sort of uh, marries it with the science fictional grotesque and it's a complete door to force. Mm -hmm. my, my concern simply is that um, if his, you know, I enjoy his prose fiction uh, and I'm not familiar with the Sandman. These are that, that, yeah, that's why I asked how many there were. I, I may have read one. You know, and um, certainly on the basis of his prose fiction, I'm not persuaded that he should be, that his imagination is in science fiction, in purely in speculative and science fictional terms, why would he, for example, uh, be ahead of, of Atwood? You know, who's a great novelist, who's written great speculative fiction. Um, uh, there isn't any so comparison between the Sandman series and anything that Atwood's written. It's a universe in itself, that's all I can say. Um, um, his prose fiction really isn't the best of him. So I come back and to the Philip uh, Pullman yeah. thing. I mean, would mm. they be comparable? I would say that Sandman cast a wider shadow, much wider shadow on this generation of writers. You can't ignore it. I mean, who are the writers that we're talking about who mm. are transformed? Who in this, I mean, if we're trying to judge the literary significance of this, who mm. uh, this generation that, in a sense, has been spawned by the Sandman? Who are these? Uh, this would be everyone from George R. 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 Martin to I don't think Atwood would have been influenced by. But uh, Martin is, in, you know, is an interesting human, genre. I would say China neither. Your hero, Nilanjana, but is he everybody's hero? I think he's the very much this generation's hero. I have well, read enough of him. Nor have I. Yeah. So we are clearly not this generation. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Way. I'm going to make that a science book. Um, the Voyage of the Beagle by Charles Darwin. Another book yes. that surprised Good me question. when I. I great, okay. great I'll well. endorse it, yes. Yep. Another book that surprised me when I uh, read it and moves me when I reread it because it's about such an important moment in human history. I think one way of mm -hmm. continuing this, taking this debate forward, would be to ask ourselves the first elemental question. What do we look for in a, in a book? What is this first impulse that draws us to reading? Is it entertainment? Is it a desire to be informed? What is it? I when you show this, I, I surely on your bedside time. table mm -hmm. you have a dozen books, some sure. of which, uh, I mean, I always have a Woodhouse. All of us have Woodhouse. I mean, read and, and yet at the same time, I would also have the rise and fall of the Third Reich. So, okay. one okay. reads okay. for a variety of reasons okay. rather than for any specific reason. Okay. And some of it is entertainment, some of it is enlightenment. Some of it is reflection, some of it is because somebody else has recommended it in a review or by word of mouth. And then one tests it out to see if you can read it. So I think, yes, there, and, uh, and a desire to know what happened, or why did it happen, and how did it turn out, I think are also questions that arise in determining what one reads. So there isn't, I think, a singular answer to your question. Although it's a good question. Has anybody read a biography of Woodhouse? There's a famous yes, one by Trump. Robert Woodrum. Yes. And what is startling uh, on a man who is the Very funniest, the most brilliant writer, what a dark life it was. <laughs> it was a deeply unhappy life of constant migration, uh, a kind of emotional emasculation a longing for children that he never had. It wasn't a happy life. Is that the truth behind great comedy writers? No, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. of uh, Jane Austen. Uh, a very unfulfilled life, yet 
she is the finest writer in comedy of manners, who is to beat Pride and Prejudice? Is Pride and Prejudice, is anybody an as ardent Jainite as I am? I'm deeply hostile to Jainites, but in fact one of my favorite, <laughs> of my favorite books is Amos' uh, book of essays called Whatever Happened to Jane Austen, Not Stories, where the title essay is an exercise in baiting people like Sunil, hmm. uh, you know, for their love. But Pride and Prejudice, you know, gets my vote without me. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why it gets my vote, gets the vote, vote down the ages. Is, uh, it's, it's just the acme of a classic boy meets girl story. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, P.D. James, the British thriller writer who died a few days ago, who said that what Jane Austen is classically is Mills and Boone's Married to Genius. She's utterly surpassed later by uh, a kind of uh, 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 protege of hers, uh, George Terra, who wrote a much oh, better novel. Terra. I mean, in fact, I have one on my list, which is These, These Old, old Shades, Shades, which is a novel which I've read at least a hundred times, but she's not respectable. May I add Sunny Mehta, the publisher? Good for him. To, uh, he published George at Hare for, for years, and I once said, Sunny, why? Why is she your favorite? She said, he said, apart from anything else, Sunil, I think she's the best, she's written the best flu books. If you are ever down with flu, just pick up George Hare. Yeah, instant kill. Next okay, Next I'll tell you what. I'm going to make uh, a big pitch. Uh, you were talking of essays, and I'd really like to nominate The Argumentative Indian uh, by Amartya Sen. As the way he puts together uh, essays for uh, a, a new India, in a way, uh, extrapolating from history, polemic, uh, strains of historical thought, whether it's Buddhism, going back into history, coming forward, a whole canon of Bengali literature. I just think in terms of polemical craft in today's uh, sometimes fractured India, uh, and it's fractured politics, it's atomized <coughs> politics, uh, it's, it's a wonderful reflection. I don't know if anybody... It didn't seem that I, uh, I, yeah, I have to say that I got the impression that these were chips from a great economist's workbench, mm. you know, that uh, if you yeah. read the idea of justice, I mean, the scope of it, the, you know, the extraordinary resonance and focus of it, um, and there are wonderful things in, uh, in an argumentative Indian, but it's, you know, it's repetitive, it's, it's, uh, it's unfair to expect it to be otherwise, because, you know, it's the compilation of what, uh, and we all constantly uh, repeat ourselves. As you've said, Amartya Sen's argumentative India. He has said idea of the idea of justice, justice. Mm. and uh, if you were to ask me, and I don't think anyone should, but if you did, I'd pick the choice of techniques. Yeah, that I mean, look, completely which was his altered totally. everything one thought of Gandhian economics. Exactly. I um, wanted to, have we looked at uh, 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 a biography of a great city? Istanbul by Orhan Pamuk, I think that's... Uh, I'm going to make uh, a pitch for an art history book. And uh, the irony is that this art history book is only to be launched next week. Uh, so I brought it along with me. And this is Professor B. N. Goswami's masterpiece called The Spirit of Indian Painting. Uh, a choice of his 101 best miniatures spread over 17, uh, 700 years. I think it's an extraordinary publication. I've event. heard about it. I don't know. Yeah. Book, so I don't know if you will agree with the spirit of Indian painting because oddly none of our lists has uh, 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 a great story on art. Uh, one of the reasons I found this book uh, fascinating as a publishing phenomenon because it's a very expensive book to produce and they brought down the price and it's taken years of labor to produce, is that it's partly modeled on one of the great bestsellers of art history, namely Neil McGregor's The History of the World in 100 Objects. So he's the director of the British Museum, and what he did was he actually just picked 100 objects from the museum, and it began as a radio series, and later became an international bestseller. Um, History, I would, you know, there are certain moments in history 
that have been written about so often, the French Revolution, for example, hundreds of books. To me, the classic account is Simon Sharma's Citizens. I don't know if anybody knows it. Uh, and if anybody is willing to endorse my vote, the great Anglo-American historian, it's to me the most extraordinarily fluent, fluent and fluid account of, of the French Revolution. Citizens by Simon Sharma. The gloss was a little taken off by when I saw him perform at the Jaipur Literary Festival. I mean, to watch this man is like watching a black hole of vanity. <laughs> <laughs> but I completely agree with uh, with Sunil that it's just a wonderfully written and constructed yeah. book, and it's the return of the narrative. It sort of inaugurates brilliantly. Uh, yeah. yeah, but how I hate. It. I'm going to sort of you know uh, come up with a couple of books of poetry. Um, um, a book that I return to time and time again, which is a Stephen Mitchell translation of Rilke's uh, Duna Elegies and Sun Storms. Um, the grandeur, I mean, there are certain things that I read because of the grandeur of the prose or the, the, the poetry. This is one. The second thing is uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, which is the foundation of text for everyone from Shakespeare to whoever you want to think of. Third one is the Kurul. I, I, this, I'm, I'm reading. Don't know it at all. I'm reading a translation now, which Gopal Gandhi is doing for me. I published the last translation, which was published 20 years ago, and I just think it stands up. You know, I mean, um, I keep going back to it. Maybe Tell us something about it. Tell us something about it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's got to do with state what period. Craft. You know, you have me there. It's um, sort of um, ancient, not not sort of medieval. It's ancient. Um, it's got to do with kingship, it's got to do with uh, what you do in times of war, what you do in times of love. Um, it's couplets, rhymed couplets. It's, and, it's, it's um, also got to do with the Chidambaram's budget. Now I'm torn between uh, things fall apart and the old man will see. Things fall apart. Things fall apart. apart. Things. Yeah, old things fall apart. Okay. <laughs> What's with Hemingway? He's sort of gone out of fashion, hasn't he? I mean, he's like a bit like... The Killers, the story. Don't know it. You know, I mean, his, I think his short stories were much better. Mm. I just find, I don't know why the old man in the sea, I think it's one of the most overrated, just it's about a man in a know, fish. I, I, I caught a marlin off the coast of Cuba, so I love that book. <laughs> it's a very personal <laughs> thing. <laughs> just goes to you know, so. The real error of judgment he made was not put the shotgun in his mouth early. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like what, to pose what, a question, Ray Hemingway. Uh, Mani Shankaraya mentioned Somerset Maugham a little while ago. Why is it that certain writers, absolutely top of their class 50 years ago, uh, fall off the map and go out of fashion? Some because more time falls off the map. I think George you know, Bernard Shaw. Great! Everybody read him, uh, went to his plays, read him Bought as a polemicist. I mean, completely, completely gone. gone. The collected prefaces. Gone. Uh, yeah, completely gone. Oscar Wilde, same thing. Wilde actually Wilde survived. Wilde stays because Wilde of the humour, because of the aphorisms. Only the because of the importance of being earnest. Also. As an appropriate play to put up at a school. Also <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I could add two names to the list of those who are no longer mentioned. One is uh, Philip Roth. And yes. his port noise complaint. Actually, yes. Roth made a big comeback uh, towards the end of. I mean, to, uh, he's not dead yet, but uh, he wrote a book called The War Against America, which is a huge bestseller, very well regarded. The Human Stain, which was a book about this uh, this professor who's conceding the fact that he's part black. Yeah. But hugely successful and influential but books. In I don't think he ever matched port noise complaint. No, it's at least in terms of what we were talking about, the book that influenced your life. Of course, it just so happens that Portnoy is, uh, that Portnoy is about two years older than I was. <laughs> and so <laughs> everything in Portnoy's complaint was actually Manishankaraya's complaint. So <laughs> it, <laughs> it therefore influenced. I'd like to nominate uh, Larkin's collected poems because I think Philip Larkin is the outstanding poet of, of the uh, English poet of the second half of yes, uh, yeah, yeah, Orton. Uh, Orton is, is essentially a poet we remember for what, a period between the twenties and I'm happy for someone to dominate Orton. It's just that personally What about Larkin John Benjamin? 
Benjamin is, is, is wonderful. I Some of my best is great. I walked book. into the nightclub in the morning. There was Kumail on the handle of a door. <laughs> the ash trees were unemptied, the cleaning unattempted, and a squashed tomato sandwich on the floor. Well <laughs> done, <laughs> money. Well done. So Benjamin is, I, I, you know, I think Benjamin is great, but I think just in terms of, uh, you know, no, he's the definitely sheer profundity and intensity yeah. and... Um, Crappy you know, old man in real life, I guess. Beautiful man. Oh, man. So Bye. we have Elliot, don't we? We have got T.S. Eliot. We had that earlier. And so I, I'll go with I'm Philip Larkin, but nasty figure, though he was. Many authors are what about real Thomas? life nasty. I mean, Elliot is not a nice man. I also want to make a case for a great English novel which, um, which maps uh, the transition from uh, a kind of pre war world into the contemporary West. And which, um, and I think the go between by L. P. Hartley has a the great claim of having the one of the, the greatest lines yeah, in yeah, the yeah. history of literature. Yeah. The past is a foreign country; they do things differently over there. And I think when I when I look at the fuss over what is in the end the completely second-rate novel by. Uh, uh, are you talking about Ian McKellen's Ian, Atonement? Ian McEwan's the, uh, Atonement. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Atonement. Exactly. It straight, descend, straight descended and from you know, L.P. Hartley, um, The Go-Between. Not a shadow of, not uh, a shadow. of The Go-Between. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to nominate yeah, The Go-Between. Yeah, the Go-Between, go absolutely. Book very close to my heart. Yeah, beautifully done. It's really like an English, it's like an Englishman trying to do the leopard, but doing it the only way that English can, mm. not making it a kind of uh, sort of melodramatically reject uh, novel, but doing it as a novel of manners. You know, who wonderful. is the, uh, I mean, I know comparisons are odious and sorry to interrupt you here, but the nearest I can think of to an Indian equivalent to Hartley is actually Anita Desai. I'm thinking of Bob Gartner's Bombay, and I'm thinking of In Custody. Uh, life among marginalized Indians again, uh, the poet Noor in Chani Chok, uh, a, a dormant or dying language of Urdu rediscovered in this, uh, and, and this Jewish emigre called uh, Bam Gatna in Bombay, uh, against this crumbling, decaying landscape of Indian cities, forgotten and you'd cities. Pick those, you'd pick I, those I, 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 it's, I find it very resonant, the ironies resonant of a kind of hartley like exploration. Yeah, I don't know if anybody the difficulty with in custody is and it's a, it's a difficulty that she that she that she confronts to her credit head on, is that she's trying to write a novel about Urdu in English. And you know, it runs straight into the problem that Indian realist writers face, which is it's almost impossible to do mimetic realism if you're writing uh, you know a novel about India and English. You have to find a literary resolution of that. And I think um, it's a fine novel, but I think it is in, uh, it is limited by by that difference. I mean, talking about it, uh, sorry. I mean, I, I have a feeling that she should be on this list, but which book would I, you pick? Uh, I, actually, let me say that I don't think she should be on this list. I think she has a cons she's consistently a fine novelist, but, mm. uh, you know, it's very hard to think of one uh, book. You know, if it, it was a career, you would your life. You know, I, I don't think so. I don't think I she's written a transformative novel. I, I think that's a fair point. I think her body of work, yeah. I think she's definitely yeah. in the top 1% of Indian Right. right. I mean, if you um, put Nantara Segal there, I mean, uh, I mean you mentioned a particular one, but I have another Nantara Segal preference, but I think Anita Desai. I, mean, you, I, I would you actually mean? argue that Nantara Segal and Anita Desai are, are in this sense novelists who have a, have a fine oeuvre, but they don't necessarily have, one in my opinion, book. one great standout novel. Uh, uh, Mani talked about <laughs> Vietnam, so I think one of the greatest books I've written in Vietnam, uh, and also one of the greatest examples of the new journalism, journalism is Dispatches. Uh, by Fantastic. Yeah. So Michael uh, Herr, so without question. Yeah, that's, that's my first Brilliant journalism. Book. It's a remarkable uh, book. Then uh, the next one is, I'm going to sort of, 1984 isn't a great novel, but it's a signal achievement. Well, or well, I would say. And my great favorite is the yeah. so I mean, Down and Out in Paris and London. But might I just mention the this point, although it's not relevant, mm. 
the fact that Animal Farm was completed in 1943, but because the Soviet Union was so important to the war against Hitler, no British or American publisher would publish Animal Farm until the Iron Curtain fell. And then in 1947 it came out. Also, it has one of those great first lines after L.P. Hartley's book. It has a you know, great first line. So, 1984. Um, then, uh, Russian novels. Um, my, one of my favorite Russian novels is The Master and Margarita. Uh, then, four. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm very, very keen to have a Calvino in there. Um, but I don't know cities. which one. Invisible Cities? That was on my I have If on a Winter's Night Travel. Uh, in, can we have Invisible Cities? Because I tried very hard to read Fine. If on a Winter's That's Night Travel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the clouds of <laughs> Invisible <laughs> Cities. I'm okay. going with the Lanjan Iron Local. Invisible Cities. Uh, okay. Um, then uh, The Stranger, uh, Camus, because it, the, the, the time I read it, it, um, it was just a huge, huge interest in my life. Were you with that? I mean, it's a kind of classic undergrad cult novel, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you were, I don't know, when we were undergrads, everybody read The Stranger by Camus. I don't know, if, uh, uh, people, do people still read Ian Rand, for example? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... I, I it was, I, it I was on par. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not the same. Sunil is perfectly right. When I was in college, there were people with Jhulas who had who had only ever read two books. They didn't actually read them. So One that? was Camus... Uh. The Stranger on the Outsider, and the second was The Heights of Machu Picchu. There's a yellow penguin, <laughs> which they all sort of carted around. I know we shouldn't, should or shouldn't we divide literature by, by countries and yawns, but I'd certainly like to mention uh, Crime and Punishment. Mm. I know, yeah, I know, uh, Dostoevsky is on some list. David, was the idiot on yours? No. No, Mughal's list. Mughal's list. Well, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm crime, crime, and crime, yeah, crime, 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 crime and punishment. Crime and punishment is... I got through the idiot and I didn't get through crime and punishment. But I, <laughs> oh, I, 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 I was riveted. I'm very, oh. uh, you know, proud of myself. Well, it's, it's like, like, it's like the choice between Anna Karenina and yeah. Warren yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, It's not really a choice. I mean, you know, Warren you Anna Karenina to die within five pages of that damn... I mean, anybody who loved anybody with muscle bound and Vronsky deserved to die quickly. So there was no tragedy. But did you know it was going to be on the rail tracks. No, that was a bonus. <laughs> yes. Oh, <right. laughs> that was yeah, well, she's perishable from the start. Uh, next, I would say, is, uh, is actually Madame Bovary. Uh, uh, I mean, to me, that whole theme of uh, 19th century theme of the corruptions of a, uh, of a female who goes through a complicated history, uh, and particularly Flaubert, it's often said in today's um, arguments, you know, there's something called the male gaze and the female gaze. But to me, what's extraordinary about Flaubert getting inside a woman's mind with such conviction and a very complicated <coughs> character. Are we okay with Madame Bovary? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great novel. It's, it's, it's not, not my favorite, favorite, but I can yeah. see that the French need to be. Uh, yeah, a lot of us see it as <laughs> one of the first texts about a woman speaking her independent mind and saying, This is what I want, but coming up against the fences around it. So I'd go, I'd go with that. Yeah, yeah, and cool. also because, uh, don't forget, it's, <coughs> it's a male writer. Mm. Yeah, but which makes it. Uh, I think he was one of us. I want to endorse Ishiguro. Uh, I think David put remains of the yeah. day. My favorite is. My favorite is. Don't let never let, never me, go. let me go. The argument no, against remains of the day is we already have Woodhouse. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no. Oh. Remains of the day is inconceivable without Jesus. <laughs> he takes this stereotype and he runs with it, and he. But the direction he takes it. <laughs> I know. I know. But. Think of remains I mean, of are you really saying <laughs> that, uh, he that is. Remains, <laughs> he remains of the day is a kind of <laughs> is a kind of precursor to Downton Abbey? No. Yes, I'm it's about a butler <laughs> and a housekeeper. Yeah, I mean, okay. That's yeah. what Downton Abbey is about. I'm saying that there is there's a great archetype <laughs> of uh, of butlering and <laughs> and balloting, which um, and housekeeping Woodhouse <laughs> supplies us with. And uh, but what would does as uh, a Japanese novelist? Uh, Mukul, you are just being <laughs> like a contrarian. No, no. Uh, just, you I'm just turned Ishiguro into an upstairs, Nefiro. downstairs <laughs> novel. No, no but, uh, but actually, his best novel is his. Uh, Unconsoled. No, the first one. Uh, Artist uh, Artist of Floating World, which is just shimmeringly beautiful. Okay. But, so I I you, but I think, for me, it remains the reason it's, to me, such a great, great achievement is 
the themes it addresses in such a quiet yet telling way. I, it, it, it's I love it. Sort of um, unparalleled. Okay, I uh, I'd say that if we are going to do transformative books, uh, the one that uh, you know that I have read is Interpretation of Dreams. I think uh, if you're going to have uh, Darwin, you Freud. have to have Freud. Freud. Yep. All right. And we have Marx yep. already, yep. so yep. I think yep. Interpretation yes. of Dreams should be here. I'd say that a personal favorite of mine as a comic novel, which uh, is individually transformative in terms of uh, a novelist's tone and how he can write his Lucky Jim. Vikings the Amos, which is a novel, which is I think one of the funniest novels. Well, my uh, favorite is Ending Up. The but English. I'm uh, fine with any Amos. So that's two. Um, I'd say that uh, the third one is, uh, I was wondering which one of the ghosts to choose, but I think Gora is the one that, uh, yeah. that I would go for. It's, it's lovely. It's a great novel. Definitely. Um, but I'd say The Great Expectation has a claim on our attention. It's, it's I think, Dickens' greatest novel. And uh, he he achieves something truly extraordinary. It's kind of... Um, I saved Copfield on all my list. Uh, so, I, you know... Uh, okay, so... Well, Dickens. Yeah, Dickens. Dickens. And because... So yeah, it's, it's you can make peace for great expectations oh. because of oh. Peter Kelly again. It's, yeah, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons, but yeah. I mean, uh, 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 that's four. Um... I'm torn between. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to push for these old shades by George Taylor, which uh, just in terms of pure pleasure. Well, you know, Powder and Patch, the Grand Sophie again. Well, George so George Taylor is a yawn with, by herself. So I think these old shades is definitive of. If uh, two out of the five like it, that's fine. By the way, in real life, she preferred to be called George. She did. She also preferred her dreadful historical novels to uh, her Regency and 18th century romances. And the sixth, I'll, I'll offer two and you can decide which one uh, seems more appropriate. One is, uh, I think there's a really great but difficult novel which, uh, which is an American novel which is rare for me because I, I tend not to enjoy the Americans, which is White Noise by John DeLeva. Suggestion, 1000 Years of Annoying the French by Stephen <laughs> Clark. It's the most comprehensive <laughs> history of Europe <laughs> for the last 1,000 years. You know, it brings I it right up to De Gaulle and Mitterrand. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Can discovery. I say, really I'm I'm 1, 000. 000.